it's a distinct honor to have, and I should highlight that this panel in particular is co-hosted by the Center for European Legal Studies. Um, uh, and therefore we are um, extremely, extremely happy that uh, Madeleine Twinga, who is head of unit and since 2016, responsible for NDG trade, for trade and sustainable development, was able to, um, uh, to join us today. Uh, she is a lawyer by training and has been absolutely essential uh, when it comes to uh, the, the Green Deal and the many EU's trade and sustainable development chapters that have been negotiated over the last few years. She's a real trailblazer in the trade and sustainable development movement. And under those conditions, it's absolutely fantastic that she could join us today. Um, over to you. Um, can you hear me? Good afternoon. <laughs> we can hear you fantastically well. We well you can't, can't see me. I can't put on a video, so you, you'll have to uh, you have to miss. Uh, you cannot start your video because the host had disabled it. Anyway, I, I can start while we are trying to uh, to address that if you want. So. Thank you very much for this um, this invitation uh, to be here. You set the bar very high with high expectations. And on top of it, you expect uh, an intervention in six minutes of this highly complex topic where we're really traveling from the classical trade um, tools, if you want, um, into a, a role discovering a nexus between trade and, and climate and, and other environmental objectives. And, that is, a, that is a really big mix of, of process, sometimes law and sometimes um, um, more economic things. So what I, what I thought I'd try to do is um, to have a brief word on the, actually the positive role that trade policy can play and what we've tried to find in the, define in the EU Green Deal um, and in the trade policy communication. Um, and in doing that, the main points of the EU trade policy review called an open, sustainable and assertive trade policy, including um, uh, sort of positive role of, of trade and climate, um, and the changes that we are seeking in the WTO to, improve, uh, to, to promote uh, the inclusion of climate considerations. Medline, just a quick uh, intervention. You can now turn on your camera. Okay. Hello. Awesome. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> Yay. Um, and um, uh, so I said the WTO, I want to have a word on the bilateral and, and autonomous measures. I, I will not enter into our unilateral um, instruments of GSP because that would be too lengthy. Um, now, maybe a brief word, and I think it's always important to emphasize that because trade policy seems to come forward as something as that's a discussion on WTO compatibility, <laughs> and it is allowed or not allowed to have a certain measure in accordance with, with trade law. And actually, um, trade policy goes much beyond that, and sometimes we forget that trade has a positive role to play. Um, so trade and climate policy can be portrayed as being contradictory, but trade, and in particular the right trade policy, has a positive impact on the environment. Open trade policies make a positive contribution, for example, by ensuring the most efficient use of resources, provided the environmental costs are priced in, hence the importance of carbon pricing. A second example, disseminating green technologies and facilitating trade in their components. Um, a third example, leveraging our negotiation, negotiating and market power to increase our partners' ambition on environmental policies. And fourthly, using trade and investment agreements as platforms for increased cooperation on environmental policies. So now what we committed to do in the trade policy review, and I think it's quite novel in two aspects. It is novel because it's the greenest um, trade policy we've ever had. Um, and it's novel because where we classically focus on the trade tools, WTO, bilateral, and what we can do unilaterally, we now bring in the dimension also of internal measures and, and how that complements trade policy and, and under which conditions. 
Um, so in the trade policy, we highlight the WTO, that we need to bring forward sustainability initiatives at the WTO, mostly focused on green, but we also have reference to labor. Um, uh, the policy reviews the develop, uh, developing further ambitious TSD chapters in our bilateral trade agreements. We also highlight that we will see commitments from the biggest emitters, notably G20 countries, on climate neutrality. So we will not conclude trade agreements um, uh, with G20 partners unless they have uh, high commitments. Um, we also announced there, and this is for the first time in, the, in our bilateral agreement with the UK has been included, we make the respect of the Paris Agreement as an essential element clause of future trade agreements. And this is important. The essential element clause is basically, um, I don't want to call it the nuclear bomb, but it is a, it's a very strong option that in case of repeated and severe violations of what we have traditionally called the democratic and human rights clause, um, that we can even withdraw from the agreement. So this is the essential element. And Paris is now intended to be included in such clauses. Um, we bring in strong autonomous measures, um, including the already adopted carbon border adjustment mechanism, but we've also made reference to due diligence legislation, which is also important for, for environment and climate, and um, deforestation legislation, which is currently in development. Um, and uh, we, we also um, uh, uh, refer to updating the general the scheme of preferences. Now, let me give a few words on, on what we're seeking in the WTO. We are actually working at, uh, at, at two levels, a multilateral level and a plurilateral level. Um, uh, as you know, probably we, we are going to have a, a, a ministerial conference, MC12, as we call it, um, as soon. And we're working hard on, on two avenues. One is a multilateral statement where we, we would like to see um, reference to the climate crisis and the role that trade policy has to play there. That would be novelty. We have so far not really referred to climate. Climate as a word in trade policy has always been sensitive so far. Um, but there's a growing realization that the WTO needs to step up uh, and play its role. We're trying to um, include language that would um, um, uh, help us to push mainstreaming of climate and environment throughout the various uh, WTO agreements and, and institutional setup. Um, and we are keen um, uh, to have also special reference to the need to help developing countries um, in this journey. Then on plurilateral statements, there are a whole range of them. Um, there's one on plastics, uh, which we're going to join. There's a, a plurilateral statement of fossil fuel subsidies, very important for climate. As you know, it's the biggest contribution to CO2 emissions. Um, and uh, we're working on a plurilateral statement, um, the test d statement, it's called, and um, a statement on uh, trade and sustainable um, development which would include um, uh, quite a broad agenda. I think at, at the core of it is what we hope uh, would be there is a more classical role of trade and eh? goods and services. Um, so can we discuss modalities or approaches that we should take for possible future negotiations on trading goods and services? Um, but that is for us not only a tariff story. Um, uh, you really need to look also into what, what, what is happening throughout the supply chain with a good a good when it arrives at the border in the EU or anywhere, um, uh, doesn't reveal how it has been produced. So you, you do not see that on the basis of the physical characteristic of, of, of a product, which is a typical classical thing we do in, in customs. And we now need to think about how do we do that, what brings you to into, um, I speak, I think, to lawyers, into the famous PPM discussions. And so how has a product been processed in order to know whether this product is indeed the solar panel, for example, is clean and the solar panel was not produced with the generation of, for example, coal-based um, um, electricity. And so, so we want to launch that, that discussion and see how we should go about it. We don't have the, the, the answer maybe, but we have to look um, as a trade community into it. 
Um, so th these are the, the, the goods and services questions um, that we want to look into. Beyond that, uh, we are also uh, taking forward, we've launched the discussion already, but we want to move it uh, further, the more conceptual discussions on the nexus, uh, including with circular economy, uh, with biodiversity and that type of, of, of areas. We are negotiating this statement. Um, and we hope to have a, a good number of co-sponsors. We have the impression now that there's quite a, a big group of countries that, that want to join. Um, then um, maybe a word on, on the on FTAs. So briefly to explain what we have. Um, within an FTA, of course, you have this positive contribution that we think we give already by liberalizing goods and services and thus promoting and helping the spread of, of technologies and uh, technology, tech, high tech, tech products that are relevant for climate as well. But we also have since 2011, the so-called TSD chapters, Trade and Sustainable Development. Um, they contain binding commitments on labor, environment and cross-cutting issues such as responsible business conduct and due diligence. They also have an in institutional setup to monitor implementation, both at government level, so the so-called TSD committees, but also civil society level. And there we've established um, uh, structures that have um, uh, advisory bodies um, on each side, composed of civil society representatives, but also joined for us so that the civil societies from both sides meet with the governments. Um, the agreement also have dedicated dispute settlement procedures for enforcement. We've had, um, actually it was the first dispute settlement case ever used in the free trade agreement, uh, was on TSD with Korea on the labor issue, um, uh, which confirmed uh, the labor commitments and the binding nature of that in the FTA. This was about um, obligation to ratify a certain ILO conventions and to effectively implement them. Um, the TSD chapters also form a platform, and that is actually a big added value that this doesn't have a, a legal value, maybe, but a, a very important process value. Uh, they form a platform for dialogue and cooperation, and we, we've done quite a lot under, um, under that platform, both at government level, but also by uh, involving um, uh, stakeholders. A brief word on the context side, um, content side, so uh, focusing maybe on environment and, and climate. So the, 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 the agreement contains um, uh, obligation to effectively implement the multilateral environmental agreements, such as CITES, uh, Convention on Biodiversity, but also UNFC, uh, C and the Paris Agreement. So for Paris, this means a legally binding commitment to effectively implement the engagement reflected in the nationally determined contribution on the Paris Agreement. As I said, um, we are now adding um, uh, uh, the essential elements clause, the Paris Agreement to the essential elements clause. So that's an additional um, teeth if you want. So for example, if uh, a partner would withdraw from Paris, that comes very close to considering that an essential elements, raising the question we should maybe withdraw from the entire agreement if a party decides to withdraw from the Paris Agreement. Um, then we are at this moment, as a result of the trade policy review, we are reviewing the functioning and the implementation of uh, the TC chapters. We've conducted um, public consultations, um, uh, which we're digesting. There will be study, a benchmarking study with systems in other countries in order to see whether we should come, whether and with what type of proposals we should come to further improve um, these chapters. So I think um, maybe a final word, um, if you allow me, because I think I'm reaching the six minutes, is a brief word on autonomous measures. Um, now, it's absolutely crystal clear for us that we are dealing with global problems. So um, addressing global challenges like climate change will no doubt require primarily international cooperation and action. But at the same time, we need to ensure that trade doesn't undermine the effectiveness of our domestic policy on climate change and the domestic policy has been put in place to meet also our international targets. Um, so the Commission's proposal on the carbon border adjustment mechanism um, and also future proposals on mandatory due diligence under a sustainable corporate governance initiative and the deforestation proposal are cases in point. 
Um, so CBAM um, was a very specific one. I wouldn't qualify it as the measure necessary to achieve our climate objective on the country. There's an enormous package, so-called Fit for 55 package, where we have a whole range of measures, partly adopted 4th of July. There will be second um, second uh, um, uh, set in, uh, in December. Um, CBAM particularly has been uh, one um, where to address the risk of carbon uh, leakage. Um, and it is not directed at third countries, but at the embedded carbon emission of imported products in specific sectors, notably cement, iron and steel, aluminium, fertilizer and electricity. I want to enter into this. I know it has provoked a lot of discussions, uh, a lot of discussions in Geneva on this, maybe because we are the first in a set uh, of measures to come that, that do look at production methods in a way of, of products and try to, to address that. Um, I, I would on overall say, of course, we, we have, uh, it's still draft law, um, uh, the co-legislators in the EU are still looking at it, um, and their, their country's concerned, their other countries less concerned, but, but what we do observe is that it has actually provoked quite a useful discussion internationally on how to look at all these things, and, and how we can cooperate on it, and, and what we need to do, so um, we will remain ready, of course, on any of our domestic measures to engage because um, effectively these affect also and leave an impact on on international trade. So I'll leave it here. Um, Thank you so much, uh, Madeline. Uh, this was um, a really instructive and and fascinating talk. Um, I, I see the questions in the Q&A button as Dr. Yotova already outlined coming. Um, we are slightly short on time, so I will go quickly to our next speaker. Um, Dr. Fabiano Danrada Correa um, is a lawyer and legal specialist on sustainable development law and policy across the public, private, and international sectors. He works as an international legal consultant since 2012 and has worked for international organizations such as the FAO, the IDLO, the World Bank, Klein Earth, and UN Environment. He obtained his PhD uh, in law from uh, the European University Institute um, and uh, holds several masters and uh, undergraduate law degrees and is originally from Brazil. So uh, we are now um, very interested how this entire debate looks um, and, and appears from the other side of the Atlantic. Uh, welcome, Fabiano. Thank you very much, Marcus, and greetings from Brazil, everyone. It, it is a true pleasure to be in this panel uh, on a topic that is not only uh, of my great interest, but also, I believe, at, uh, at the center of, of the current talks on climate and trade and, and other topics that I believe you converges uh, different areas. Um, I'm not sure if I am supposed to share my slides or those will be shared for me. Uh, I can also go without slides if it's easier. Okay, perfect, thank you very much. Um, I uh, thought of my intervention here as also uh, a bit more introductory as we'll have uh, panelists covering more in-depth specific topics. And I will uh, try to build on, on Madeline's very comprehensive and extremely interesting and thought-provoking uh, thoughts that she just shared with us. Um, if you can please uh, go to the first slide. Thank you very much. I wanted to, to start by uh, sharing a statement that I read from uh, a WTO Deputy Director General, Angel Ellert, at a recent event on climate action, where she said that the WTO is not the place to establish global climate policy and, goal, and how goals will be reached. And she says WTO, however, plays an important role because it, 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 uh, its rules govern taxes, tariffs, sub subsidies, and other instruments that are relevant for implementing climate policy. Now, I thought that this was interesting because while, of course, she uh, is right that perhaps WTO is not the place to establish global climate policy, um, and, and we have the UNFCCC for that and, and other, other arenas, uh, as Madeline just said, and, and just in comparison, uh, trade policy has 
a very strong relationship with climate change. And I think uh, one that is increasingly being recognized so inescapably, as, and I believe this discussion will certainly uh, uh, come up in, in our discussion today, WTO is, is a key forum uh, that will also be playing potentially a decisive role in climate policies by member states and organizations from around the world. So uh, in, in summary, the trade and climate change, uh, uh, it, part, it, it might be a part of the problem and a part of the solution. And I think Madeline hinted to that as well. There are positive and negative sides that all depends on how we tackle it. So we have on the one hand, the WTO and multilateral negotiations and uh, which uh, have been stalled on many issues for many years and regional trade agreements, which are uh, in a way, of course, connected to the multilateral negotiations, but have been progressing much faster than the multilateral negotiations on many issues. And that is the conducting line of what I want to share with you today. Next uh, slide, please. So just briefly, in terms of positive contributions of trade policy to climate action, we have issues such as lowering or liberalizing tariffs in environmental goods and services, EGS, which were quite hyped before the ESG became so hyped uh, in the last two years. I just hope that the ESG will not follow the same path of the EGS and become stalled in terms of the international negotiations, though they have been now included in many other uh, negotiation uh, pathways. So we have, for instance, uh, the interest in liberalizing or lowering tariffs in innovative technologies for a lower carbon uh, transition, such as renewable energy materials, but also in the services needed to support them, such as the installation and operation of clean technology. This is, of course, an important contribution that a trade policy can provide. Also, other points such as coordination and collaboration on trade and climate change, which at the WTO, an example of a topic is carbon pricing, as Ms. Madeleine also mentioned, which is uh, a, a very important topic for for climate policy as well. And then we have also the WTO as a forum for information exchange, for instance, with the environmental database that the organization keeps and the Aid for Trade Initiative, which I read recently allocated $65 billion in the late, uh, last year to climate related projects. Next slide, please. But then we have also many challenges. Uh, and, and one is of course that uh, an increasing trade in itself might be uh, an increased source of emissions, but then also, and importantly, the trade is associated often with an increase in environmental degradation. And we have supply chain of risk commodities, as, as they are called, such as beef, soybeans, palm oil, and wood products, and, and the connection to deforestation. And an example quite close to home here uh, is research that suggests that the possibility, or, or demonstrates actually, that the possibility of trade with foreign countries affects allocation decisions of land used in the Brazilian Amazon and indicates that openness to trade causes the rate of deforestation to increase, absent measures uh, that would, for instance, prevent the marketing and purchase of products originating from illegal conversion areas. But then also challenges uh, include potential clashes between trade and climate policy. These are not well coordinated. Uh, and, and a topic that I believe will come up in the discussion today as well is the border tax adjustments and, and the potential of that leading to trade wars and how to accommodate the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities in the design and implementation of such measures. And then multilateral negotiations uh, being stalled in issues such as the EGS, as I mentioned before. So now I'm going to enter into the regional trade agreements. And please, next slide. So uh, as, as the title of my presentation indicated, uh, regional trade agreements have been progressing and innovating in terms of measures uh, to provide more contribution to sustainable development and climate change issues. This was actually uh, the topic of my PhD dissertation almost 10 years ago already. And I believe it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting uh, very interesting example of how uh, regional measures might pick up from where the multilateral negotiations have started and provide more in-depth measures. And we have examples such as more procedural elements, uh, including uh, impact assessment uh, procedures of trade negotiations, an example being the EU sustainability impact assessment initiative that has been ongoing, I believe, at least since 2006-07 
and most uh, important trade negotiations have now been accompanied by such a, an SIA uh, report, which, uh, though not being necessarily mandatory on negotiations, do provide transparency and increased information on the impacts on both sides uh, of, of proposed uh, trade measures. <coughs> Excuse me. And, and therefore, are, in my view, an extremely useful uh, type of policy measure. Uh, then regional trade agreements are increasingly incorporating measures such as cooperation uh, on issues such as the implementation and upholding of international agreements, uh, such as Madeleine has said as well, that the EU has been doing. Liberalization of trade in environmental goods and services, uh, for instance, the EU, Colombia, and Peru uh, free trade agreements, uh, committed parties uh, on the promotion of, of environmental goods and services in the uh, uh, in the trade rules part of the agreement, uh, which, uh, which in, in this case do, does provide uh, an increased incentive considering that the multilateral negotiations on PGS have been stalled uh, for many years. And then uh, as, as Madeleine also hinted already, these innovative trade and sustainable development chapters of EU uh, trade agreements that have been uh, present in most of, of the agreements signed in the past, I don't know, 10 years. And we have examples of measures, again, such as uh, in the EU, Colombia, and Peru, that the parties agree to promote international trade in a way such as to contribute to the objective of sustainable development and to work to integrate and reflect this objective in that trade relationship. Um, and others such as not to adopt or apply regional or, or national trade investment measures in a way that may limit environmental and natural resources protection. Next slide, please. And then I'm sharing here a report that I co-wrote with some members of this panel today with Marcus and Marius Tokas, but also Javier Castres last year that provided an in-depth analysis of measures proposed in the EU Mercosur trade agreement and a comparison with other EU FTAs in which we analyze and propose also alternatives to measures that are included in the draft agreement. Uh, and, and here a couple of more examples in, include, um, for instance, uh, the fact that this agreement highlights specific areas of trade and environmental uh, cooperation, and uh, specifically has a section on, on trade and climate change as a focal area for cooperation in their trade relationship, therefore bringing trade and climate change policies much closer together in, in, the, in the body of, uh, of a trade agreement which is uh, innovative in itself. I'm, I'm not gonna go through all the provisions because I know that I'm running out of time. Next slide, please. Um, I just wanted to make a final point and perhaps we can come back to this in, in the discussion uh, that uh, a key point that stood out, uh, stands out, I believe, uh, and, and we made this point in the report is the fact that uh, the trade and sustainable development chapters so innovative are uh, usually characterized by being formally excluded from the main dispute settlement system of, of the trade agreement and having a separate uh, uh, approach such as consultations and etc which though as, as might have been effective uh, in in some cases um, are a challenge because uh, as we know a, a major uh, point of, of strength of trade policy and, and trade law has been the strength of, of the dispute settlement as, as an enforcement and implementation uh, mechanism. And therefore, uh, by excluding these trade and sustainable development chapters from the dispute set settlement mechanism might weaken the, the strength of, of these provisions and, and make them closer to other, other provisions of international law, such as international environmental law, which as we know, uh, though not formally being soft law, uh, uh, face much uh, much uh, heavier implementation and enforcement challenges, I believe. So um, I'm, I'm going to stop here and, and thank you very much for the opportunity to, to be part of this discussion and really look forward to, to questions and, and, and exchange with other panel members. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Fabiano. And I think, am I handing over to Rumi or am I doing one more introduction. You have one more introduction. Okay. 
Um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Alessandra Lemon, who is uh, also an absolute superstar uh, in the uh, trade and sustainable development field. She's one of the uh, most recognized um, uh, international environmental lawyers from Brazil, uh, where she also obtained an LLM and, and PhD and an MBA. Um, she has been uh, working as a climate lawyer um, and most recently uh, made a significant contribution uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the Oxford uh, Human Rights Hub, where she authored um, the climate fund case, climate litigation reaches the Brazilian Supreme Court. Uh, warmest welcome, uh, Dr. Alessandra. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, Marcus, thanks for the extremely um, uh, kind introduction. Warmest of thanks for having me at, the abs at this absolutely fantastic and much needed discussion. I will not be using slides today as I feel um, uh, I have a lot to pack in my allotted uh, six minutes. So, uh, and I'm a fast speaker anyways. So uh, today I would like to reflect on whether uh, the international community needs to brace for a climate trade war and most importantly, on whether it can be avoided. I had the opportunity to meet uh, Girl Brundtland at Stanford a couple of years ago. And so I asked her what would be her one recommendation to curb carbon emissions. Her rather straightforward answer was, and I quote, it's simple, make it expensive. So carbon trade mechanisms are a way to do, to do just that, making emissions expensive for climate laggards. Uh, the primary purpose of border adjustments is to prevent carbon leakage. That is the risk that high carbon imported goods that pay little or no carbon fees would make the market share from low carbon fee paying domestic firms, thereby at the same time defeating the effort to reduce global emissions and harming the domestic industry. So indeed carbon trade mechanisms could incentivize climate action globally by establishing uh, low carbon economies as more trade competitive. They could push industries within jurisdictions uh, facing carbon trade barriers to push for uh, more ambitious uh, climate policies overall, including uh, carbon pricing. But perhaps more importantly, uh, this could challenge the view that transitioning to a low carbon economy is economically, economically uncompetitive. But it's not that simple uh, as one might imagine. Border tax proposals are controversial for uh, two main reasons. First, uh, a fear of disguise protection that would violate WTO rules. Uh, second, fear of opposition and obstruction uh, of cooperative action to reduce uh, global emissions, actually, at the end of the day, undermining Paris goals. So if not implemented correctly, carbon trade mechanisms could incite retali retaliatory action from governments facing the barriers on their products, or even, in a worst case scenario, withdrawal from the Paris Agreement. So the question is, will trade carbon trade mechanisms create a domino effect in climate policy and push more countries to act on climate or conversely, will they lead to carbon trade wars? Uh, the challenge therefore is twofold. So it's uh, to implement carbon trade mechanisms in a way that one is conducive to climate action and two uh, does not clash with the relevant regimes, namely in this case, the international climate regime and the international trade regime. Uh, so from the standpoint of the trade regime, current WTO rules are designed to prevent a full-blown carbon trade war. So WTO compliance is important to ensure that carbon trade mechanisms are not overly protectionist uh, and remain in line with international trade uh, regulations. From the standpoint of the climate regime, a relevant concern is the possibility that carbon trade mechanisms could incentivize companies to um, reshore protection away from countries uh, without adequate climate policies acting as a dis disincentive to high emitting countries to act on climate and creating potential uh, carbon clubs of countries uh, with similarly priced carbon. So being as they are at the intersection of international trade and the climate change regimes, border carbon adjustments uh, need to be robust from a legal standpoint. So a couple of measures to preempt a climate trade war could potentially include 
um, uh, cooperation to promote a positive agenda of free trade of, of, of low carbon products and technologies, creating a, so to speak, low carbon trade agreement. So that beyond FTAs, uh, we would have an LCTA of sorts. Uh, whose policy, uh, policy menu could include several measures, for instance, zero tariffs um, for defined set of low carbon goods and services, a common energy efficient st efficiency standards, uh, mutual recognition of technical standards, uh, reduction of um, a timeline for reduction of fossil fuel subsidies, um, implementation of the, TC, of the uh, TCFD framework at the level of, of corporate governance and disclosure. Um, also, from the standpoint of abidance by the WTO rules, I think that uh, carbon trade mechanisms can probably be more robust if we make sure that the revenues actually go to climate action. Um, another uh, sticking point for, for this type of mechanism is on how to uh, include implicit carbon taxes that are used by other countries uh, in a legitimate way. Uh, to pursue their own decarbonization goals, for instance, other than explicit pricing, banning uh, the banning of coal-fired uh, power stations. Uh, also, we could think of some form of favorable treatment for developing countries and particularly least developed countries. A sectoral approach um, that would uh, focus on the most carbon intensive sectors uh, ensuring that the carbon trade mechanisms only cover sectors where inclusion affords clear environmental and climate benefits. Also, the geometry of such agreements perhaps, perhaps would, would be able to, to, to reach an easier uh, consensus. Uh, mutual recognition of rough equivalents of carbon pricing structures is also, is also uh, something that, that, that pops to mind. And finally, there's also the question of what would be the best venue to implement such measures. Is it a task for regional blocks, for countries to negotiate bilaterally, uh, for the OECD, which has shown an interest in doing so, or should it be done under the aegis of multilateralism? Uh, either way, analyzing these possibilities and these dynamics, I think it's important specifically uh, considering uh, potential contributions of the law to overcome tensions between, on the one hand, the need to address the climate crisis, and on the other hand, uh, the pressure to enhance international trade, particularly in the wake of the pandemic. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much also for, for keeping to time. Uh, over to Dr. Yotova, please. Thank you very much, Marcus. So it is my real pleasure to present our next speaker, uh, Marius Tokas, who is a PhD candidate at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva, where he also did his master's degree. And he's also an associate research fellow and program coordinator with the Center for International Sustainable Development Law. So Marius, over to you. Thank you very much for this uh, presentation. Thank you very much for calling me to be part of this fantastic panel. So I will speak about uh, climate change in EU, UK trade and investment uh, policy. I will focus mostly on the FTAs. And so I will try to avoid repetition, especially service. The previous speakers, especially Madeleine and Fabiano have already talked about this. And I'm going to discuss a little bit about the EU trade policy. And I think Madeleine's presentation is from person far more appropriate than me. So if you can go to the next slide, please. So the goal of this uh, brief presentation is to put a comparative analysis between EU and UK. So we'll focus mostly on FTAs. So we'll not talk about uh, domestic measures like the SIBA, nor about the multilateral level. Uh, we'll talk about a little bit about the EU, UK Brexit negotiations as a starting point of divergence or convergence. Then we'll move on to the trade and investment agreements and to see afterwards uh, some future options. Next slide, please. Thank you. So again, I will try not to repeat myself with the EU trade uh, policy review of 2021. If I may just notice something that uh, it has been highlighted throughout uh, uh, the trade policy review that uh, climate change is indeed EU's uh, top priority. This is what uh, is illustrated throughout the trade policy review. And it's mentioned both at the internal level and the unilateral level also the bilateral and the multilateral. So on this basis, EU tries to negotiate new trade and investment agreements, if you have like mixed agreements, and also certain new sustainable investment agreements that are focused only on investment facilitation 
and they try to incorporate climate change uh, provisions, particular provisions in those agreements. Next slide, please. On the other hand, uh, with regards to the UK, the newly formed Department of International Trade has uh, focused in many of its excerpts or contributions to the House of Lords and has highlighted that they want to build up uh, UK's export uh, in the green industry uh, by liberalizing trade in green goods, green services, and also attract and promote foreign direct investment with regards to promoting mitigation and, uh, and adapt to the climate change and also help developing countries on this, in this regard. So with regards to their FTAs, they try to ensure that by 2050, they will reach the net zero goal. They will try further to, uh, to promote uh, clean growth and promote cooperation on mitigation and reduction of global emissions. And on this basis, they first have signed agreements with EU, uh, with existing EU partners. So what they did, they adapted the text that has done this with regards to their relations. They made, for example, some changes onto the concessions or the commitments, but the overall text of the treaty is the same. While they have also uh, initiated negotiations with states or blocs uh, that the UK, that EU did not have an agreement, like New Zealand and the uh, CPTPP countries. Next slide, please. So if we start first with the TCA uh, drafts, because there we can see a little bit of convergent divergence, the UK draft did not address climate change issues. They referred to general environmental concerns and regulatory concerns, but the idea was that they were going to regulate climate change through a separate agreement with regards to energy. On the contrary, uh, EU draft uh, was far more ambitious and they included particular obligations to climate change in their level playing field chapter with particular commitments towards uh, 2050, the reduction of uh, uh, emissions, non-derogation provisions, and also upholding and increasing the levels of protection. Uh, next slide, please. So at the end, what, what, what was the settlement was more of an agreement that followed the EU lead, but still there were some compromises. For example, in the non-derogation clause, uh, the text of it seems to be a little more relative than absolute. So previously, the non-derogation was absolute, so you cannot derogate in any, event, in any case from your existing climate change levels of protection, while the existing one links derogation with trade and investment measures. What we have seen from the recent EU Korea FTA panel, this standard, this the standard of linking trade and investment measures to labor or to climate change is low, but still it is, I would say, a, settle, a settlement or a level below the absolute text that existed before in the EU draft. So again, climate change is part of the level playing field uh, chapter. It has uh, it reaffirms the ambition for carbon neutrality, the dedication to increase levels of protection and also introduces principles on carbon pricing. And the last thing that we're gonna notice is that in Article 4, 411, they introduced a rebalancing measure, which is kind of uh, a tricky issue because it, it allows for countries to introduce measures in favor of trade and investment in cases of significant divergence as a result of climate protection policies. Uh, it, it's not the present time to fully discuss this, but this may, uh, uh, be a trigger of concern with regards to the absolute level of uh, in, uh, non-derogation and increasing the levels of protection in the future. So in the TCA, there is uh, a pivot towards uh, convergence, but still there is some divergence with regards, and we can see it from the drafts. And this divergence, uh, if you can move to the next slide, please, becomes more evident in the, in, in the new, in the currently negotiated treaties. In the EU, UK has recently agreed in principle with Australia and New Zealand, and uh, they have commitments to climate change, but these provisions are much less ambitious than what we can see in the EU, uh, in the similar EU proposals with uh, Australia and New Zealand, and also in other EU agreements and even existing EU agreements. So if we can go to the next slide, uh, we can see that, for example, in the EU Japan, which was directly applied, uh, it was uh, uh, agreed by UK on the same text with some minor differences, we see there that the level of ambition is even bigger and EU-Japan is not one of the more, more highly ambitious treaties that the EU has signed. So we see here there is a level of, of divergence as UK, even though it tries to in, incorporate issues of climate change in its treaties, does not reach the level of ambition that previously had under the EU bloc. If we move further, uh, the next slide, please. So here are some examples from the EU and the community FTAs that show that the previous EU treaties or the existing EU treaties are 
much more ambitious with regard to climate change and upholding the levels of protection. Next slide, please. Uh, so when going to the investment, EU, uh, UK has not signed any new investment agreement, but, uh, but it has adopted again previous agreements by EU, such as the UK-Vietnam agreement. They have an agreement in principle with Australia and New Zealand that will include investment protection and they want to reaffirm the right to regulate, but have yet to see the exact uh, text and how it will be incorporated with climate change. EU, on the other hand, has agreed on principle with China. The current agreement uh, in principle includes only liberalization of investment, but has an extensive chapter with regards to sustainable development and to climate change in the inclusion of derogation obligations, but they're still, they cannot be seen to the same level of ambition as other EU treaties, especially since they seem not so much enforceable. So uh, we have to see when the, in the final uh, EU-China agreement, within a, which has to be settled within the next two or three years, when it will include also investment protection, to what extent it will, the climate change obligation will be incorporated further and become more ambitious. And lastly, the EU has also started to introduce market, uh, new agreements that focus mostly on market tax and investment regulation and promotion, such as the EU Angola uh, investment facilitation agreement that it, it's been negotiated, and as well one with EU with, the Eastern, uh, with uh, Eastern Southern African states. Uh, next slide. If I have. Yes, so this is the example of the EU-China uh, agreement in principle when it has particular uh, provision with regards to climate change and investment. Uh, next one, please. And so where do we stand? So the UK is currently con uh, considering joining the CPTPP, which is a treaty that has no reference to climate change. And it's also negotiating a trade and investment agreement with the US and going through the discussion of the working groups there are no discussion with regards to environmental climate change. So this is a concerning issue. Hopefully this will be addressed as we move forward and especially now with the uh, COP26. Uh, 20, uh, but right now the CPTPP and the discussion with UK are to not show a very highly ambitious plan with climate change. So we remain to, it remains to be seen whether it would follow the EU example, but also on the other hand, whether EU will introduce further and more ambitious climate change provisions. And as uh, Fabiano previously mentioned, when we're examining in our research, the EU Mercosur draft, it's not a very ambitious plan. And with this a draft agreement that has been a little bit in installment for the past uh, almost five years. So it remains to be seen what further can be introduced. And also to see whether EU will introduce further climate change consideration throughout the trade and investment agreements, not purely in a separate chapter, but for example, in the definition of likeness, whether introduce green sub, uh, issues with related to green subsidies, to expropriation, to technical barriers to trade, or to market access considerations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marius, for a very stimulating uh, talk, raising a lot of interesting and important questions. Uh, now, our final speaker is Dr. Eva Balunova, who works in the fields of environmental law, EU law, and climate law at the Institute of State and Law at the Czech Academy of Sciences. She is currently involved in two large research projects uh, on climate law and decarbonization. So, Eva, doctor, over to you. Uh, hello, good afternoon. Unfortunately, I cannot start my video because the host doesn't let me, but it doesn't matter. Thank you very much for having me today. Uh, in my today contribution, I would like to uh, deal with the EU contribution under the Paris Agreement through the 2030 climate and energy targets. Uh, first slide, please. Uh, I will just briefly look on the obligations under the Paris Agreement and then on the EU 2030 climate and energy framework. And then I will mainly discuss and analyze the challenges which the EU is uh, facing while setting its uh, climate target. Uh, in the end, I will try to analyze if these challenges justify the possible lack of ambition of the European Union. Next slide, please. But you should be able to turn on your uh, camera now if you want. Ah, yes, ah, we yes. can see Thank you. you. Brilliant. Thank you. So the Paris Agreement is mainly a procedure agreement uh, it has a quantified objective in Article 2. However, um, to this, uh, to this uh, 
uh, objective should lead the nationally determined contributions and the uh, requirements for these contributions are mainly uh, procedural. There are also some substantive requirements, uh, for example, in Article 4, and this is the principle of progression and also the requirement of the highest possible ambition, that the contributions should reflect the highest possible ambition, however, uh, also reflecting its common but differentiated responsibilities. And also on the picture here, you can see that the current policies and pledges and target unfortunately do not lead to the targets, uh, to the target in, uh, stated in the Paris Agreement. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I guess you are all familiar uh, with the EU uh, 2030 climate and energy targets. Basically the European NDC is the CO2 emission reduction uh, well, uh, originally it was set, was, uh, set uh, on 40% reduction toward 2030, accompanied with some targets for renewables and energy efficiency. However, uh, these um, ambitions were, uh, were higher in the European Green Deal. And then in uh, December 2020, uh, the European Union um, uh, submitted its updated submission and now the 2030 target is the 55% emission reduction accompanied with higher targets for renewables and energy efficiency which are uh, now under like the legislative in the legislative procedure and also the European Union um, presented its 2050 uh, climate neutrality target uh, next slide please uh, however, uh, uh, studies says that uh, based on the fair share principle, the European target is not uh, sufficient because the European Union has high uh, CO2 emissions per capita and also a high historical emissions. Next slide, please. So I tried to analyze the challenges which the EU is facing while setting its climate target. Um, there are some, I call them obstacles to EU climate leadership. I divided them into four groups, uh, legal uh, challenges and factual challenges, and also internal and external. Uh, I looked mainly in the, into the internal legal challenges, which I, uh, uh, for example, they are stated here, it's the institutional structure of the European Union. By this, I mean the legislative procedure, also the principles, the principle of subsidiarity and proportionality, also the unanimity voting in financial matters in the Council of the EU, uh, the right of the member states to their energy mix, etc. External legal obstacles would be, for example, the WTO law or the uh, legal regulation of the international aviation, and etc. And the factual, of course, it's the position of the member states, which is reflected in the legislative procedure, and also the problem with implementation of the targets in each member state. And external uh, are, of course, is of course the international situation. Of course, the European Union is uh, trying to overcome these uh, barriers or these obstacles. Internally, uh, we had uh, the effort sharing uh, decision, the effort sharing regulation, uh, according to which the member states were, uh, were supposed to decrease its CO2 emissions based on their uh, GDP. And also the European leaders are trying to frame the green transition as some kind of opportunity to be the global clean te green technological leader. Externally, of course, we have the problem with carbon leakage, uh, with carbon leakage, which now the European uh, Commission is trying to overcome by presenting the um, uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism. Also, um, the European Union tries to regulate international aviation, etc. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and I look mainly uh, at the institutional. Uh, uh, barriers. I looked at the EU legislative procedure and here of course the in the Council of the EU the member states have different positions. 
Uh, the European Parliament is traditionally recognized or um, recognized to be green and environmentally and climate friendly. It uh, proposed higher targets than the Commission. Also, it proposed national targets, for example, for the renewables or for the uh, energy efficiency. And also, it proposed interim target for 2040. However, many scholars claim that the European Commission uh, shifted from its leadership position because it proposed relatively low targets toward uh, 2030. Also, it did not propose national targets and also originally it did not propose any 2040 target. Uh, last slide, please. And however, in the European Green Deal, we can see uh, increase in the ambitions. Um, the, the targets were not proposed as high as the European Parliament proposed. And also still the national targets were not proposed and also the 2040 target was not proposed. So many claim that the European Commission does not have, is not so ambitious anymore and it has more shifted more to some uh, strategical position, which is better for bargaining the targets. Uh, and my last point is that uh, if we look at some current case law in some national member or in some member states, we can see that maybe the targets of the proposed by the European Commission would not be considered sufficient because in the famous Dutch case, the Urgenda case, uh, the Dutch uh, court stated that Netherlands as um, developed state should uh, decrease its emissions by 2020 by 25%. And we know that the European goal was only 20%. Also, the Dutch uh, court stated that the competitiveness of the economy is not, um, is not possible, that the lower ambitions are not possible to be justified by the competitiveness of the economy. And in a recent uh, German case, the Nauwire at all from this year, the German uh, Constitutional Court stated that the um, targets for uh, or that the emission reduction must be done proportionally. And we can see that the European uh, Commission did not propose interim targets for 2040, which was uh, the problem here in the, in the German uh, law also. However, there was one, uh, let's say, European case against the European Parliament and uh, Council of the EU. This case was dismissed on procedural grounds. So the, the plaintiffs were not successful. It was the People's Climate case. But um, I think this does not mean that the, that the ambitions of the European Union are sufficient. So thank you very much. And this is all. Wonderful. Thank you all very much uh, to our fantastic speakers. Now, Marcus, if you agree, I think in the interest of time, we can move on to some of the excellent questions that have come from our audience. And I will try to group some of them together because I see we have a few questions relating to uh, investor state dispute settlement and how that works in relation to the environmental provisions. So one of the questions comes from David Patterson from the Global Health Law Groningen Research Center, who asks uh, about the option to sue governments under ISDS and whether it threatens to derail climate action, uh, giving the example of German coal companies suing the Dutch government. Uh, so what, what is the way out of this? And then we have another related question um, that comes from Ariana Lippi, um, who is a writer and researcher. And that question is for Dr. Correa. And she's asking what legal avenues do people have to address the environmental degradation caused by trade agreements? Uh, and are they mostly led by civil society organizations? And I'm going to abuse my prerogative of the chair and tie in my own question on ISDS in there. Uh, and I would be very interested in what Madeline thinks about whether including some sort of third party dispute settlement in the environmental and sustainable development chapters would actually give them more teeth and make them more effective. 
So over to our panelists. I can start uh, if you want. So trying to address a little bit of, uh, of everything. So with the investor state dispute settlement, like it's, I, I could say the first and the, uh, the response would be yes. Indeed, it always hampers and have seen many cases that go that uh, countries that introduce environmental regulations, not so much to climate change so far, mostly where, for example, for forest aggregation with mining, etc., especially Latin America, they have been forced to, to pay huge compensation for environmental measures. There were other implications to that, but the first response also to that was, okay, let's introduce specific exceptions to regards to the environment, et cetera. But recently we had the ECO or versus Colombia decision, which again uh, crushed this expectation because even though you had an exception on environment, still we don't know the damage yet because there will be a decision in the future. They said that, yeah, it may be excused, but you still have to pay compensation. With regards to EU and UK, both of them are considering not introducing ISDS in their, in their agreements. I know that recently UK said that in the Australia and New Zealand uh, investment agreements, they will not have ISDS. But on the other hand, what I could say that we have seen some litigation in favor of climate change. There was the one case, Peter Alar versus Barbados, when environmental regulation was used on the offense, that because you did not abide by your environmental regulations, you frustrate my legitimate expectations. Still, this may not be a good enough of a case to propose to have an ISDS, but definitely what I could propose is always to have a, a third party litigation for environmental obligations. What we saw in the EU Korea FTA and also with the EU Ukraine decision, again, an FTA, you can actually enforce environmental obligations through uh, such FTA bans that are specialized to environmental or to labor concerns. If I may add something, no, I just wanted to quickly address David's question, excellent question about the, IS, the ISDS mechanism. This is something that caught my attention a while ago, uh, particularly its implications on climate policy, both climate policy and climate litigation. And uh, I think, yes, there are obvious implications. We have seen case after case in that sense. I think it's also interesting to mention that uh, ISDS as a whole is undergoing a review process under uh, UNCITRAL. And I also would like to, to mention that Brazil may be an interesting case in point when it comes to the application of ISDS because we have been historically resistant to the adoption of ISDS and it hasn't prevented us for, for uh, receiving uh, um, uh, foreign investment. Of course, we have plenty of other uh, uh, reasons uh, hampering, uh, the pre preventing our, 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 our ability to, to, to become recipients of, of, of foreign investment. But uh, uh, the fact that we didn't adhere to ISDS mechanisms isn't one of them. So this is, this is something, might, that might, something that might be worth looking into. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there's currently a huge storm uh, in Brazil where uh, Dr. Danrade is, uh, and so his connection is not good enough, uh, Romy, to answer uh, the, the question. If we could go uh, back to Madeline um, and, and ask her the, um, uh, the, the, the questions that were uh, posed by the audience. And if I could also uh, abuse my prerogative as chair and, and, and just um, uh, briefly ask, should the, the legislative process not result in uh, CBAM or not approve CBAM as a mechanism uh, would that really um, significantly uh, weaken the uh, the ETS, or could there be um, more sort of international carbon pricing measures that the Commission might be pursuing by way of international agreements? Sorry, I've also, I don't have a storm here, <laughs> but I've, I've had on and off uh, a, a bit of connection issues. It's, uh, it's here, my, my, my internet. 
although I, I'm, I'm finding that my internet at home is working better even than in the office. The office is not used anymore to, we are, we're still at 50% time, but I see many of you are also still at home. We're still in the universal. Uh, so, um, I mean, there'd be many questions. Could you, um, Dr. Rumanyana Yotava, I didn't fully grasp your question on third party access. Are you talking in WTO or in bilateral agreements and third party access for whom? So um, if no CBAN does it weaken ETS, I mean, I, I don't think we're venturing on it because what we've detected, and I think there's also sufficient studies on it, is that there is a risk of carbon leakage. So you, you do get to the question, how do you address carbon leakage? And that is a direct result of us having um, uh, put up uh, an ETS system within the EU. Um, so I, I don't see this as... Um, alternative to an international, that we need to work internationally and we, and we are and we want to. I'm not sure that everybody is going in the direction of carbon pricing, but we certainly want to, to talk. Um, I think that the conversations are also as a result of all this dynamic now on CBAM are intensifying to see also what is the regulatory side of it and can you make equivalence? I think that's an extremely complex discussion. We're not going to solve it in one day. We do need to have it, but, but you're talking about which measure and there are so many measures. So um, uh, we should certainly work on that and we will want to do it, but I, I don't think that we can say um, uh, there is an alternative. We simply need to now, if we want to move ahead and certainly also if we now um, go ahead with the elimination of free allowances, which we uh, intend to, 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 to drop out. So in the meantime, maybe you can clarify the question. Yes, you heard about. yes. of course. So what I had in mind was whether there is any uh, consideration of adding a dispute settlement mechanism within these trade and sustainable development chapters or to add them more broadly to the existing mechanisms within the treaties, whether in your opinion, that might uh, make these standards more effective. Uh, okay, so we have a dispute settlement mechanism um, uh, following a pretty classical model of uh, establishment of a panel of experts, um, recommendations, etc. Uh, we've had our first test case uh, with uh, Korea. Uh, and as a result of, of, well, maybe not only as a result of that, but I think it has been an important factor. Um, uh, it has helped also the pressure to have those in favor in Korea of labor reforms to push the legislative reforms through. So what we needed concretely was commitment to ratify pending ILO core conventions and to effectively implement them. So that has, that has happened. So we have a dispute settlement mechanism. What we also have is uh, as part of the monitoring system, uh, we have a government body, but we also have a body composed of civil society stakeholders, which we find very important because that is also a channel to help us in the implementation um, to do this. Maybe what I hasn't highlighted that is not part of the agreement, but I think another important leverage point is that we have now established a, a so-called uh, chief trade enforcement officer. And with that, we created a single entry port where, where you can deposit complaints about compliance, for example, with free trade agreements, um, including TSD chapters, but also GSP. Um, so we are now receiving our first complaints and it's not that there is a new dispute settlement mechanism created. You use the existing procedures, but you have a much higher political profile and a much more systemic approach towards managing all these complaints and um, using also as part of the leverage um, uh, um, more coordinated actions to say, okay, um, I have my timelines, I need to take action, I need to trigger dispute settlement. If you want to prevent it, this is an action plan, or can we negotiate an action plan, and that type of thing. So um, that in my reply to that. And then I see that there's also a question, I, 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 I'm intrigued by it. <laughs> I don't know if I have the answer. Um, Ilya Aratskik, sorry, I hope I have the right pronunciation. I also have a difficult name, Tarninga, Tarninga. Um, you ask whether the current state of international law, including the fight against climate change, affect the regulation of universal access to sustainable energy sources. I, I find it a difficult question. I, I can talk from a trade perspective. I, I, I guess that we're trying to do is to promote access to sustainable energy sources, right? So I, um, I, I would say that it's... Um, Effects. I, 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 I would need to know a little bit more what you're, you're looking at. 
and then I, I you can help me reply to that question. Is there any other other point you want me to address? Mr. Only Gale. if you have any comments to the other presentations and, and vice versa, if our other speakers have any comments or questions to each other, uh, just as a way of closing this wonderful session. Um, no, I thought they were, they were all um, very interesting and very good. Um, I mean, the, the, these are topics about which we can talk endlessly, you know, is CBAM good, is it not good? Uh, should we have an international agreement, investor to state, I hear. Um, these are all very, very actual things now. The, the only thing that I, 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 I want to add is that it, you, one of you already highlighted that we have our agreement with China as well. And as you see in there, we also have a TSD chapter actually in our investment agreement. Um, in, in, for investment agreements, the whole climate discussion is also important. There, there are important also legal dimensions to that. Um, so I, I think we're talking about an area that's really extremely interesting. And both by law and by simply how do you do it and more the leverage point um, will be in big developments and very interesting to follow. So I, I congratulate you with the organization of this and uh, with all the interesting presentation. I hope to stay in touch. Thank you. Um, just one quick shout out to our fantastic online uh, moderators, Kejaf and Sophie. Um, is there any remaining question that we can answer in one minute? We had an incredible series of questions posed into the Q&A chat. Um, and we had a very interesting question from David Patterson at the Global Health of Groningen Research Center about asking whether the option to sue under the investor state dispute mechanism threatens climate action as a whole. Yeah, I'm not sure we can give an adequate answer in one uh, minute, but uh, if uh, there are any volunteers, I'm looking to Marios, Alessandra, uh, to, to give us a very short answer because we are out of time. Uh, quickly, as we said uh, previously, also with Alessandra, like mostly the answer would be yes, indeed, there is a uh, hindrance. It is interesting, though, to read to the sustainable impact assessment that uh, the European Commission made for CETA and for other agreements, when they say that ISDS does not increase environmental de degradation. So they say that it's not to the negative, but they not really provide evidence that may be actually a positive thing to uh, environmental protection. But the question, if you go through the case and to the international practice, most probably will be no. Uh, I just wanted to very quickly add that when it comes to climate litigation, uh, I think it's a mistake to consider that uh, uh, companies and governments are necessarily uh, going to be defendants. I think they're just not going to sit idly, uh, and uh, I think they're going to they're they're going to go on the offensive and uh, to actually challenge climate policy. And ISDS is one instrument they have at hand to do that. So. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Rumi, last words. This is also your area, isn't it? No, I, I just want to thank all our speakers for such an engaging panel uh, and hopefully meet you in person one day. Thank you very much. On behalf of the Center for European Legal Studies, the law faculty and um, all the co-organizers and co-hosts, Thank you very much for uh, your participation. I'd like to highlight the student volunteers, rapporteurs and, and uh, online moderators who helped us um, do, the, do this session despite the, the slight technology hitch at the beginning. And uh, yeah, please come to Cambridge uh, when you're uh, in this country because it's actually also very nice in person. Thank you, and that concludes. Marcus, would it oh. be possible to simply mention that there is now a health break, and at 3.45, we hope that you will be all able to join us online for either your choice of climate and the wealth economy, integrating science, law, economics, and policy with thanks to the Bennett Institute and the CISDL, 
or corporate climate change engagement and regulation, advancing net zero corporate commercial and financial law and policy with thanks to the Hughes Hall Center for Climate Change Engagement, together with some colleagues from the uh, European um, Bank for Reconstruction and Development, EBRD. So um, I'm suspecting that some of the people who are presently in this session may be interested in that second one especially, and that will be running from British Standard Time 3.45 to British Standard Time 5 o'clock. So we do hope you will join us at 3.45 our time. <laughs> and thank you as well to our chairs and to our brilliant opening speaker. I've really, really enjoyed listening to all of you, these wonderful presentations. Thank you. Thank you.